All right, so it should be a short leg. All right, welcome everyone to our Facebook Live. So excited to see all of you join us today. Uh, my name is Reese, and I work with Agurian Trust and the Puget Sound Agurian Commons, um, and have had the um, yeah the joy of getting to know Adasha and Modest Family Solutions, and and help um, hold and share this uh, this vision that we're all building together. Um, I don't want to take up too much space. I'm not who you're here to see, so I'm going to turn it over to Adasha. Uh, Adasha, would you like to introduce yourself uh, to our, our Facebook Live community here? Yes, um, and thank you for having me. Thank you for so, so many different things, but um, definitely for giving us time and space. I'm here to, to kind of do intros. Uh, my name is Adasha Turner. I am the founder of Modest Family Solutions, um, Oma Sustained Agroecology Center in Everett, Washington and now um, Black Seed uh, Farm and Agroecology Village in Woodby Island. Yay. Um, what do we, we've, we've been around doing uh, growing food hydroponically, looking really at connecting folks to um, heritage, culture, healing um, within growing, you know, growing spaces and land acquisition and being mutual aid in these food systems that we serve in. And um, it's just been a journey these last two years. So we're diving into a lot of different things. Um, we have now um, with partners and just um, uh, the community, we have a lot of different operations going. So we have a farm stand in Bothell. We have the um, um, Agroecology Center in Everett um, now, and we'll be um, in Woodenville at Small Axe doing some farming there, some urban farming, and now some rural farming out in Woodby Island. So we're kind of spread all over, but um, you'll be seeing those three names um, often and it's still us. So just different entities, building a social enterprise is very complicated, but thank you. Yeah, great. And I'll share some links um, here in the chat for folks so that they can find, you know, connect on Facebook, connect with some of the websites. Um, but you know, agroecology is not a word that lots of people encounter uh, every day. So can you share more about like why that word is so important to your work and why you're putting it into the name of this uh, of this farm that you're launching? Yes, and thank you for asking because I always assume I've been using it so often that um, that people know what I'm talking about. And so they'll just say agriculture and it's like not quite. So I think um, speaking to the youth at a lot of the conferences and having to break it down really made me understand how disconnected we even are from the concept of um, uh, inter interdimensional um, uh, systems so um, or interdisciplinary systems. Um, while I was working in um, hydroponics with our youth um, and getting them to you know, kind of gather sense around nutrition and growing their own food and sustainability, there was a lot of components that weren't covered just in agriculture and farming. Right, because you're looking at economic systems um, that this food is going to go into, and then you're looking at um, the community that's growing the food, and then you're just you're looking at the environment that it's impacting, especially in hydroponics. So the more you learn about it, it seems like a really grandiose, you know, system, but it's minus the soil. And so when when we're teaching um, agriculture to the youth. And we're teaching, you know, water cycles and whatnot. And, you know, they have brilliant minds. They're like, well, if we're planting in, in water, when you're looking at the water system, there's no trees there, you know, to soak, to soak up the water. We're putting them in, you know, over here. And I was just thinking that that's a it's like valid point. Young people, yay, hope. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, also, um, so I had to kind of step back and not just think of food systems, I have to address all the systems in order for it to make sense to them, especially as they're asking questions. So agroecology is the combination of studies of agriculture, um, economics and environment in systems of community. Thank you. Um, welcome, I see a couple more folks have joined us. Uh, we're talking live with Adasha Turner, she's from Modest Family Solutions, um, which is the new leaseholder for the Gardner 
what was the Gardner farmland on Whidbey Island. Um, so really excited to welcome Adasha and all the crew from Modest Family Solutions to the Puget Sound Agrarian Commons um, to grow this vision for food sovereignty um, in, in the Puget Sound region. Um, Welcome, thank you all for tuning in. Yeah, so uh, as you said, you're thinking about this in terms of systems, you know, Modest Family Solutions is an organization that has a bunch of different initiatives. And to me, that means a lot of people giving a lot of time and a lot of heart. So who are some of the other, um, both, you know, specific community members or communities that are involved in these, um, in these projects that you're working on? Oh, wow. Um... I feel like like at the Grammys, right? You don't want to miss anybody because then they're going to call you up. <laughs> <laughs> and say, hey. <laughs> um, but there's a there's a lot of value value partnerships. I think the first folks to even um, give us a, ch a chance was the so Stomish County Community Foundation um, when they saw that we were just giving food at a time um, during COVID. They're just like, you know, what can you do with this funding? Um, we'll fiscally sponsor you, you know, for this. So that was awesome. Um, but then there's also barriers to that, um, to where we weren't able to. So because of those barriers and my backgrounds in clinical neurophysiology, which is another, I like long words, it seems like, but um, uh, pretty much I, 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 I create pathways and neural pathways of work around the things that aren't um, gelling or making, you know, or impeding the system. So making things patent. So efficiency is definitely my thing. Um, it's, it's, it's not a very social thing. Um, I'm in my head a lot of the times, but um, yeah, in, in, in that, just seeing um, with, with us addressing some of the gaps, a lot of the other doors opened up, even though at that time, like it didn't make sense to have all these different partnerships. You would think that one person would pick you up. So community foundations, like, you know, you're doing great with food, um, uh, food distribution here, UW Washington, um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Washington, UW Washington and Wazoo um, has been key in helping us develop a, um, along with 26 other BIPOC organizations in the Puget Sound. Um, we are currently forming a Pacific Northwest BIPOC Food Systems um, Collaborative um, that I help facilitate along with EcoTrust, um, even though they have had somewhat of a history, they um, provided a platform in order for us to get on and step away. So I think what's been nice is seeing a lot of organizations come together and allowing us to do our thing and supporting that. Um, and so, um, goodness, what's another one? Um, NAACP, Snohomish County. Um, we have communities of color, um, Snohomish County. Um, we have, uh, we've worked with Wasat um, in, in Seattle. We've worked with Seattle Housing Authority. Um, we've worked with, um, uh, the Muslim Association of Puget Sound and um, helping with the resettlement of the re Afghan refugees that are coming here and uh, uh, West Washington, West, West African society that handles about 2000 families of refugee and immigrants there. So per, um, the, we sponsor four food banks, we support four food banks and um, a number of food pantries. So there is no limit to collaborations and it's just really pulling resources together and seeing the limitations and being a nonprofit and seeing the limitations of, you know, capitalist or contract um, enterprises and really um, barking up the right tree, you know what I mean, to, to, make, to make things work. So um, yet we are still waiting on the Snohomish County to, to, to the, the whole, the county in itself to really um, give value to this because we've been doing a lot of work um, with a lot of different people, boots on the ground. Um, my team of, of six AmeriCorps, um, the Schultz Foundation, the community, um, Common Threads has been really vital to this program because they were able to um, put us in contact with AmeriCorps and the Schultz Family Foundation, who was able to um, provide salaries for our six AmeriCorps youth to help bring this to life. So with that, the city of Bothell giving us a farm stand um, under um, a, a small business incubator um, project program for two years helped us out a lot, uh, taking the, the produce that we were having and putting in transitional housing, um, like Housing Hope and Hope Works, putting ed edible community gardens there um, and still having a lot of produce left um, because Washington State, um, um, I keep saying UW, but uh, Wazoo had asked us to grow 
4,500 tomato starts last year during their um, plant sale, and they were only able to take half because of COVID. So we had to really reach out within a lot of community facing organizations um, in order to not waste, especially as we've, as we've taught the kids so much about waste, <laughs> um, for them to see it kind of keep going and knowing that we're an educational program first, uh, and we do mutual aid. It was never a profit you know, model until we got to the point of sustainability. And we had to um, now look at how do we make livable wages you know, for our youth coming up that are our next, our, our future and our farming and our food systems because there's so much we don't understand or we're not being taught that's not out there. That's very limited post-secondary. And it's not something that's, we, we do it naturally and it's intrinsic, but there's a disconnect when it comes to actually sustainability within the community and food systems. So putting a lot of that back on the map for us. So there's many partners, many, many, many partners. I mean, and Gray and Trust is just let let us level up, you know, on on that capacity building. So, yeah, it it really sounds like um, you know that you all have been running at full tilt, you know, for the entire pandemic, and I feel like that ties in really well with. You know, you uh, you and Modest Family Solutions have expressed to us as the board both kind of your short term as well as your long term vision for um, for Black Seed Farm. Do you want to speak some more of like how you're hoping to land with this land uh, in the short term, and then what your long term uh, goals and dreams are at this point? Yeah, I mean, we've had in any space that we've occupied, we've had some very um, difficult and hard conversations. Um, even though I know it's a great trust, you know, good intentions to make this work. There's, you know, been a lot of efforts in many places, you know, where there's just not a lot of BIPOC community and there's definitely not a lot of BIPOC community that own land. So um, now that we have access and the 99 years was something really important to us. Um, but now that we have access to the land, like knowing those systems, like I can dream all day long about what I want. But I mean, there's zoning, there's all kinds of things, you know, that goes on into that. So just getting a lot more information um, about that, but also really processing what's going on and what's transpired. Um, the first thing that I had to do was bring our elders out to the land so they can reconnect because this is not something that they ever thought, you know, would be would be possible. And I still get questioned like, is this true? Is this is this is this real? Have I found like the the fault in this yet? <laughs> you know, or have I has the the rug been pulled from underneath me yet? And it's like, no, this is this is a real thing. We're moving forward. So I think the first three years is just going to be hardcore planning um, because we're the growers, we're the producers, we're the distributors, uh, we're the manufacturers. We do all the work. We just don't have the currency to make these systems happen. So reaching out and hearing so many people that are doing the work, it, but they're not, they don't have the title, you know? Um, real, wanting to contribute, this is, it can be a huge model, you know, for folks throughout the, you know, the nation on like, what does this look like? And so being very intentional and intentions take time, you know, so this is not a rush process. I'm hoping within those three years, we can really come together. But this first, the the, the first year or so, there'll definitely be some celebration, you know what I mean, of, of the land and the re restoration that's going into it all the way around. So even just being on the land, away from the city, taking that boat, decompressing is something that's been like refreshing for, for all of us. So now it's just prioritizing that, putting it into our schedules and making a habit, you know, and also, you know, how is this going to keep continue to benefit community without restrictions? Because right now everyone has to work. So um, yeah, it's, that's the, that's our, our first plan is that reconnecting and how we show up. And then after that will definitely be the planning, but I don't intend on ever putting a system in place that wasn't inclusive of all systems. So we can't have youth farmers on the land farming for $7 and 50 cents, you know, and if we're going to make that the wage for farmers, you know, across the board, I mean, we may increase it here or there. We have to have affordable, affordable housing to match that. And if we can't provide the affordable housing, then maybe it should, there's so many funds out there that it can be, it can be built and to where $7 and 50 cents works for them. You know, but the whole the whole goal is to make this something sustainable, a different model um, that folks can see that it does work. So looking at everything we put into on the land, making sure it's environmentally um, compatible, 
You know what I mean? Looking at the, the systems that are already there. I think something that's happened during colonization is that we look at land and space and we want to develop, but we never respect what's there. We don't take the time. And so that's exactly where we're at, you know, preparing the land to receive us as we receive it. Mm, that's so beautiful. Uh, I love that. Uh, you keep coming back to sort of youth involvement. And I wonder if you can talk some more about like why it's so important to your vision, both for Black Seed Farm, as well as all your other initiatives for youth to be involved and youth education to be um, such a core focus. Um, yes, and thank you for that. Um, I can say while launching the gardening program, you know, having Uma Sustain as being the name of it and then being told, you know, it's a radical Islamic terrorist group, you know, and it's like a gardening club of like four to seven year olds. Like, so really having to do so much education on just having a gardening program at a university was pretty telling to me that we're just lost as a system. So if I have to do this much educating to a university as to... <laughs> <laughs> the, the difference between, you know, a terrorist and a non-terrorist and, you know, um, then what are our youth going through? So um, we did launch a Facts Over Fear series um, last year for the university, thinking that it would be a way for um, 4-H folks to um, connect urban youth with rural youth. And so we can do a Rites of Passage, passage program together, but we end up doing the program for the faculty. And that's when it, it made sense. Like these, if we're educating the people who are educating our children, you know, at the same time they're learning, it's not like see one, do one, teach one when it comes to um, racial equity, equality, it doesn't work that way. So I feel, I don't want to say that we're lost. We're, it's all a, a, a plain level field right now. We're at places that have been uncharted and just unknown to us, you know, up until now. So the youth and it's not even, it's not, it's youth to me, but it's 17 to 25, you know what I mean? Because these are the career pathways that they're going to be, you know, in doctrine in. And not only that, they're not given any other options. So we're just feeding that age range straight into a machine of, of systems that we know don't work and are not compatible with us. So I just want to get in where it makes sense. Um, there's, a lot of the older generations, yes, they have them. There's a lot of dollars in no sense, as Ramis would say. You know, the the older generation, they do have that, you know, going through the channels and the chain, you know, and, and all of that. But there's always been glass ceilings and, you know, or, or invisible ceilings that we don't encounter until there's a barrier. So why not prepare them for that? They have the energy. That's something I don't have. <laughs> they have the energy to go out, especially with the protesting. I'm like, this is great. Let's put that, you know, together with a, a system that you can get behind and move forward. And then not, not only that, because times are changing, technology is changing at such a fast rate. Our, our modifications to food are changing at such a fast rate. Like they need to be on because they're going to be able to connect to the generation after that, the seven and eight year olds. So that youth led is, is, is necessary because we have to motivate them again. If not, they know the systems don't work. So there, there's no buy-in. If we can't sell it, they can't buy it. Right. And, and, and it's not, it, it's, it's not working. So um, just really having them involved and letting them know that there is not only education, um, involved, you know, with this, but there's a, there's a way that you can maintain and, you know, it may not be the $75 an hour that you're looking for, but it's definitely, um, something that, that can set you up in your community up, you know, to, especially as prices for everything are going through the roof. Really, I'm um, hearing throughout, you know, the conversation and conversations we've had earlier that, um, this, this whole systems approach, it's not enough to grow food, we have to also look at the distribution model. We have to also look at the um, relationships of power within those systems. We have to look at how those systems are developed and who's holding that. Um, and I'm I'm curious if this is because of your uh, your need to take on so much in order to begin healing um, healing pieces. Uh, the individual pieces have taken on holistically. Um, was it the 99 year lease, that, that length of time that really drew you to the agrarian commons model? Um, and oh. were there other, other parts of the model that really spoke to you that allowed you to be able to feel like you could take, take on something this large? Yes, um, actually while I was studying permaculture design um, over in Spain, that was something, um, the agrarian commons, when we were talking about in a gifting economy, 
or an economy that didn't focus highly on the currency, since we are doing every aspect of it as a community, growing, um, distributing, developing, marketing, like sell, we're doing every aspect of it. The only thing we don't have is that currency. So what would actually happen if we took currency out of it? And not all of it, but just some of it. And are there systems that have happened or occurred throughout time where they where that's been successful? And the answer is yes. So when you look at pre-colonial work, and even though we're saying, you know, we want different curriculum, it's like, what exactly is the curriculum that you're trying to achieve? Uh, what were your outcomes of this new curriculum? So if we keep trying to evolve out of without going back, which is, uh, like I said, Sankofa, we need to go back for what we've forgotten, what's been lost or what's been torn from us. And that's exactly what we're doing. If we look back through that history, we see that in more Spain, that there were systems of agriculture that supported, you know, the community and plus in magnanimity. And it was um, something that was lost um, after that that system was torn down to develop slave ships to to bring folks over from Africa and just seeing how that all connects and what was destroyed what was filtered at that point like erasure has been going on it, before it you know it was a hip term now like it's been going on for a long time when it comes to civilizations that and they weren't even necessarily against capitalism it was just looked at there's something that can thrive just as well um, that's community driven. So um, really looking looking at that and bringing that those components over and really studying that, not just with me, but the youth. And, and when we're talking about reconnecting to land and reconnecting to who we actually were as, you know, the African diaspora and a lot of indigenous and Af Afro um, indigenous folks that are here and just reconnecting on that. So there's those systems. And then as we're trying to you know, heal, we don't want to re-injure or keep ripping the scab off because of these barriers. And then you just start suppressing. When you do that, you create codependency because you all of all of, of your whole being is for something. And when you see that you can't get it, you're going to try to attach to the next thing that that's closest to that. And normally those systems are not ran by people who have us in mind. We talk about white architects. The people who designed systems after that never had us in mind as in, in positions of power. They've only had people of color in mind as a source of labor. So we haven't changed those systems. So in order for us to really being able to heal, you have to look at all those systems that white architects designed for us from our education, how we were educated, where we were educated, where we were able to live, what we were able to eat. All of that was designed for people that really didn't look at us as, as humans. Two things are, are jumping out to me. One is you're talking about um, the sort of gift economy and, and sharing resources. And, you know, I want to share out with uh, the folks who are watching a, a big part of the reason that Puget Sound Agrarian Commons Board really resonated with the vision of Modest Family Solutions and your other initiatives is because we share this, um, these values around gift economy, the gardener land was gifted to uh, Agrarian Trust to help launch the commons movement because Carolyn Gardner on Woodby was worried about food production in her community and the cost of land and the barriers to access. And, uh, and we saw so often that in addition to your education, in addition to you know, trying to address some of the school to prison pipeline and a number of other kind of complex topics that you were coming to the conversation with um, gifts in hand to the community members with that understanding that there's wisdom in reciprocity as opposed to a, a charity-based model. Um, right. And I was going to um, second on the half of the other half of that question. Yes, there's been organizations that have offered us land, but the contracts and the terms are all to steward it. And it's, you know, one to two years, five years, and then you may get 10 years out of that. But once you pour your heart and soul into, you know, tending land, for that amount of time, I mean, I'm 44 now. I don't want to do this when I'm 55. I don't want to pick up and do this again when I'm 65. I don't want to pick up a, and after 65, hopefully, you know, I won't be doing it, you know, at all, or maybe starts or something like that. But if you think about how much that is just not reinforcing of community, um, it's not reinforcing your sense of being, your wealth, the value of the work you're doing when you're always being uprooted. And that seems to be something that that's where they see, you know, 
farmers, folks just being able to, to move when it comes to BIPOC community. So when we're talking about that 99.8%, you know, of the farms are, are Caucasian um, farms, you know, in America, and it's like going, we don't have a space there to even secure our own food. Mm -hmm. And so we're always going to be at that other end unless things change drastically. And I know folks don't want to give up land and, and, mm -hmm. and bless uh, Ms. Gardner for that, but they want us to steward the land. And that's the exact same thing as sharecropping. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we want equity in that. So I want to be able to plant seeds and, and, and have them grow 99 year roots. Mm -hmm. You know, that my daughter and her and my grand, I'm now going to be a grandmother for the first time you know, next month, inshallah. Um, and that's just something that is like, he will have land. Like he will have a place to come and farm and community that's gonna be here. I had never thought about that before. And even our elders, like I said, just having them there as much as possible and processing that, so processing that. So the 99 years was definitely a way for me to, to, to look your way, especially um, with what's going on. There's a lot of you know, there's allyship there, but, you know, it's a lot of newfound, you know, trauma informed, you know, allyship going on. So you can't really judge a person's now intentions versus because they only know what they know. Right. Mm -hmm. And so by doing something, not really understanding the history of that type of even mentality, you know what I mean, of land in the U.S., that can be damaging. So to start at a possibility of 99 years was just refreshing you know, not having to explain all of why we need land. We do have a, a business model that I'm told will do well and I can get a loan for 1%, but I they didn't understand why I didn't want a warehouse instead of why do I want land? They couldn't put it together. And um, just looking at my business or pro proposal or, or uh, people in the, um, the, uh, the I, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the politically correct word to say, but people, <laughs> people in the capitalistic world, you know, they don't look at um, having employees as a benefit. It's actually termed as, you know, a negative asset. And it's like, how, could, how are your employees a negative asset? Like, that's what makes the business thrive, especially when it comes to food. And we have that saying, like, you know, you can taste the love, you can feel the love in the food, because that's what was put down. It was put down with love. If we have machines and people of heartache, you know, that are, are, that are doing this work, that's what we're getting, non-nutrient dense food. We need that love. We need, that's part of the nutrition that needs to come in here. So that 99 years made a huge difference for me to being able to say, this is the place. I wanna um, spend some more time talking about, you know, building a, a black uh, and other people of color centric food distribution system. But first I wanna like circle back and talk about, you know, the, the, uh, the larger social issues that you're talking about that Modest Family Solutions and the other initiatives are trying to take on, a lot of people are trying to solve these from a lot of different angles. And I'm curious why, why food, why food and farming as the, as the heart of your initiatives to, to try and solve these? Um, we have a saying, is that a saying? It's like a Hadith in Islam. And we know that the, uh, the world is going to get worse you know, um, and there will be powers in place. And so one of the, one of the um, hadiths are, you know, why, are, why, you know that this system is wrong. Why are you following this person? And the answer was, is because he feeds us. And when I hear that, and you hear even in the, in, in Christianity, the rich will get rich, the poor will get poor. We hear these things, but are we actively doing anything to secure ourselves to where we're not in that situation? You know, um, I believe in a lot of stuff. Like I, I'm a Muslim. I'm a I'm a I'm a God, you know, fearing, believing woman. Um, that's passionate about a lot of things. So, don't. It's me. Anything that you take that's negative is is part is, is me as a person and not on the religion. I'm making that disclaimer right now um, because we all are working through it. Um, but. There's a lot of things and ayahs and signs that are here. You know what I mean? And those signs, they come in different ways and different people and who's brought into your life, but you could also see them in the earth and the changes that are around you. So you just have to be aware of that. And so because I've spent a lot of time in isolation, whether it was working in an OR for 15 years or in bed for three years or, you know, partially in a wheelchair now, and then just trying to do 
you know, what I can, you know, while I have energy, I spend a lot of time just looking at those signs around me and how if you study nature and biology, biodiversity is huge. It's necessary. You know what I mean? And the best diversity and the and the and the the evolution is at the edges of that biodiversity. If we keep trying to put things in a box, you know, within parameters, you know what I mean? It's not gonna ever evolve into something that's organic. So anything that this is that's this confusing, it was by design, by artificial design. So when we look at a lot of biomimicry and st stuff that, you know, we see that's perfected. You know what I mean? It's like, why don't we use that when it comes to really sovereignty for ourselves? And it's because we don't have that land. So it all comes down to that that kind of possession and just knowing that the community can always come back to this space. So just a, having access to a lot of community land trust that we know that this is a haven for that and that mentality that hopefully can be nourished and nurtured to going in and acquiring more land and more spaces this way. Mm. Um, yeah, I want to uh, take a moment to invite uh, the audience who's following along. If you have any questions, go ahead and, and type them in the chat as we're having a conversation and we'll, um, yeah, either pause to, to answer them if it's in the flow of the conversation or we'll come back at the end and make sure. So just want to make sure that invitation, this can be interactive since we are, are live. <laughs> yeah, I know because we're having a good conversation here about things that I know we're we're both really passionate about. Um, I want to talk some more about you know your vision for a culturally competent, um, sovereign food supply chain that is meeting the needs of Black folks, meeting the needs of Indigenous and um, other people of color. And I think that uh, some people, particularly like white folks working in food sometimes sort of struggle with why why the existing infrastructure isn't working what the gap is when they can see the foods in the community and so i'm wondering if you could share more about your your vision for this supply chain that is interconnected and why why there is this need um to make shifts within it um i would say first and foremost just applauding um indigenous folks for holding on to their traditions especially when it comes around food um we and and seeing you know how they were able to preserve that within the school school systems and the in the um being part of you know farm to school farm to fr farm to scratch a lot of the programs that are out there we just don't see a lot of BIPOC and when I say BIPOC I'm speaking as a black woman um who's who's raised born and raised in America um I am American um I'm Muslim I most of the folks that I know are either immigrated here or they're refugees here. Um, and so we don't have those access where I, when I, when people say like BIPOC and yes, indigenous are included, they have been able to preserve a lot of, you know, their systems where we haven't. So when I say BIPOC, I'm specifically think, talking to the people who have not been able to preserve, um, no shade or disrespect. Um, I'm, that's my truth. Um, but we don't have, we were, we were fed the scraps, right? Of leftovers and pigs and hog and just the, like very cheap meat and whatnot. Um, not that we, we couldn't, we couldn't afford it. So um, looking at things um, and, and it's, that's been the way we've adapted throughout times. So looking at these food boxes that are going there, like we feed Washington and we're giving out five pounds of potatoes every single week. And it's like, okay, BIPOC. This is BIPOC food boxes, Black, Indigenous, people of color, Latinx, Middle Eastern, Southeast Asian, we all eat rice. So why is there an emphasis on putting these potatoes in this box when we know healthcare disparities around potatoes, you know what I mean? What the, what, the potatoes, um, they don't compost well. You know what I mean? There's even in Idaho, you have to have certain um, waste management requirements for large amounts of potatoes. And so folks who can't process it, how or why are we not looking at that system? So cultural relevance is huge. We are in a rainy state. What, why are we not growing rice here? Why are we not growing instead of making it the earth? And, and that's what agriculture does is you're cultivating what you think, what you wanna feed people or what makes money. You know what I mean? Instead of working with the soils and the lands and what's here and growing things that 
actually makes sense to where there's no waste. So when you're talking about zero waste, you're looking at from the seed to the trash, you know what I mean? Or the seed to the recycle, the receipt back to like, you have to complete that loop in order for it to make sense. And when you do that, you see a lot of foods that aren't typical American food. You see a lot of cultural relevant food, cultural appropriate food. So the disconnect between what's relevant, what's appropriate, what works you know, in an agroecological system is who has the money and who's funding the food systems. So you have to look at that um, and you have to make change there because if we're not getting the food that we, that we want, that is slaughtered properly, you know what I mean? That, that is handled properly, that is raised properly and we're having high hormone you know, food or, or, or highly chemically altered food, how are we gonna survive? We're sicker as a nation right now. We're not better with all this technology, we are sicker. And it, our bodies have not been able to, been allowed the fortitude to adapt with the changes that we're putting into the food because we keep modifying them. And so um, it, genetically altering things, like, I mean, it just, it just keeps going. Um, so it's, uh, it's just important. It's important that culture relevant food, because most of the food that we grow are things that we can actually grow in the soil and grow right here. We don't have the resources to modify anything. We don't have resources to um, do it the not right way. You know what I mean? We don't have resources to shortcut. So if you think mm -hmm. about that, you know, we're growing smaller amounts of chicken. We're, you know, doing smaller amounts of grain. We're looking at the like very efficient ways to make things work. So why give one man a thousand acres instead of a thousand acres to, to, to each or, or one man having a thousand acres or having a thousand men with one acre each? And so when you're, get, when you're talking about permaculture design and people growing their own food, that, that's very important because then we're able to micromanage what we need to in that space and, and produce high quality food. I wanna um, talk some more about yeah, the, the gap sort of in the halal meat um, distribution and, and some of that. But before I ask that, I just have, I'm now burning in curiosity, like what kind of food, uh, what, uh, what could be grown here that makes you feel really nourished? Um, I'm going to try a few things, but definitely like um, okras, um, tomatoes grow well here. The ones that seem to be not modified as much do well for people that have sensitivities for it. Um, we're gonna try black IP. We're, all of our garden is a culture relevant, you know, because we start in hydroponics, it's nice because we're able to um, cheat somewhat um, in hopes of getting, they're, they're in hopes of getting those types of varieties here, but that at the same time, really understanding what is native here. You know what I mean? Um, and going back to larger fields of that to where we can explore, you know, kind of nurturing things that that are here um, already. But definitely um, a lot of people like collard greens. I'm a mustard greens type of girl. So when this all happened, I was like, yeah, we have greens. We have not one mustard green. What is going on? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but um, so now we have, all, you know, we have about 600 mustard green plants, you know, in, in the grow now, we have a lot of, you know, lettuces and whatnot for people to make those sal salads, but just definitely just the yams, you know what I mean? Over the potatoes, um, definitely the corns and, um, and not having them modified because there's just a lot of things. We can talk for hours about corn. <laughs> yeah. But, um, really getting, um, getting better grains of it. You know what I mean? Really um, uh, going down to the sorts and starting our own seed banks. You know what I mean, and being able to share with community. But um, that's the the those are some of the things I definitely that we're growing here. Uh, we've we've grown eggplant, um, carrots have done well. Um, a lot of cauliflower this year because we're able to do a lot of things as far as like having it be a rice, having it be a pizza dough, having it be. I I think that's something that's really going to help sustain and really giving this land space and time for us to connect with indigenous folks as reconnecting um, BIPOC members. Because um, especially with all of the genetic testing that's going on right now, a lot of, of us are feeling like, you know, we have parts of us we don't even know. So mm -hmm. um, if some of that's here, just being allowed to, to grow food that works well here. Um, and then also 
kind of cultivate that or start that in the hydroponics, which would allow for longer periods of soil regeneration, you know what I mean, to where we're not having to force the land, um, and, but having fish, you know what I mean? Fish has gone up um, dramatically, but if we're able to kind of provide that in a system to where, because um, it's in the sea, it's halal for us, um, but being able to use carcasses or whatnot and go back into that bio, you know, bio nutrients that we were talking about, but then also, you know, growing halal meat and having it prepared without the stress and prepared properly. You know, um, it's called uh, it's called zabiha. Actually, halal just means anything that's permissible in Islam. So mm -hmm. it's not pertained to food at all. It's I mean, well, it's pertained to food, but it's not only pertained to food. The law and the the jurisprudence around halal is called zabiha. So there's certain practices that have to happen in order for that that um that that chicken goat cow you know that um lamb to be slaughtered and it's never it, it's never for you know just to have on a shelf you know what i mean it, it's actually feeding community um the animals they um they're not slaughtered in front of each other you know what i mean they're allowed to drain they're in a comfortable position you know um a, a lot of like i said just things happen it's not something mass produced it just takes a lot of the humanity out of that when something is given its life in order for you to, you know, maintain yourself and your sustenance. So just having that level of humility along, uh, you know, the whole way when it comes to food, um, it's a gift. And we talk about that in the gifting economy. That is the gift, the magnanimity on what we can grow in abundance to community and have and and be available for them to eat, you know. And it's not something that is for the rich and only, or, you know, the poor just gets to, like, everybody's able to come out and do this. Everybody's able to plant a seed. Everybody has access to good food and food that's good for you. Yeah, I really, I'm, you know, continuing to hear um, themes in, you know, both the sort of like the challenges of, of this and the visions for what you're hoping to dream of. Again, holding holding all of the gifts that the land and animals have for us as, as a gift in reciprocity to be nourished by and to give nourishment to and to the whole communities. And especially like you're, you know, talking about how um, for meat to be halal is not just uh, that it sort of follows, you know, a checkbox of like, here's the way that it's treated, but right. um, the relationship with the animal uh, and I, and you yeah, mentioned earlier that there's been though. some challenges, you know, growing and trying to find halal meat here, and there's been increased interest from non-Muslim farmers in participating in that in that food chain, um, but without maybe the understanding of the the holistic approach to it that it isn't just a certification. Right, that was something that was really surprising to me, being in food systems, because we do have relationships with our ranchers um, and farmers um, in in BIPOC communities. So when I heard that because the increase in the funding that's out there for halal meat, they're like, I'm just gonna get halal certified. And it's like, but it's not Zabiha. And they're like, I've never even heard of that word. And I was like, that's actually the law that you need to know in order to make it a halal, like to have halal meat. And in that is it's performed by a Muslim because that because of that connection and that intention that's there. And so it makes it really hard. Like, are we gonna capital, try to capitalize, you know what I mean? and hijack halal and zabiha meat now because it's, yeah, it's more expensive. And it's because that money normally goes to the farmer. It doesn't go to the process. You go to the, you go to the farm and you pick up the meat from the butcher. That connection is maintained all the way through. There's never like these huge middlemen people. That's why when large organizations, they want to do a halal meat drop off, people don't eat it. Or they only give them processed food meatballs and chicken strips and it's like that that's not even healthy you know what i mean what, well how is that the only option that you're giving people if you're choosing to participate in halal we want fresh meat just like everyone else and we want the autonomy to being able to prepare it the way we need to prepare it um but when these organizations are giving food and it's meat like you they really want to see who's doing the slaughtering because it can't be anyone so a lot of folks, and we did it as I traveled for 15 years, we were vegetarian whenever we went somewhere new, you know, so we had to make sure it's not that we didn't want meat, want, um, you know, we didn't want meat, we had to make sure, you know, where our meat was coming from. And granted that 
because of access to halal meat and the price, a lot of people aren't able to eat halal all the time. And that's unfortunate. So we live in the land of convenience. And so if it's not convenience and there's no opportunity to get it and grow it or, or, or to slaughter it, you know, you're kind of making people conform into a system. So it, that, that just seems to be the name of the game here. Yeah, I'm really I'm hearing again, sort of like these parallel themes between, uh, you know, the agrarian commons approach, which is around decommodifying land, making land a community center, making land relationship centric again, and and uh, the black the vision for black seed farm being a place where relationships are at the center of systems rather than systems sort of facilitating relationships. Does that that sound right? Definitely. I want to make sure sometimes I don't want to put words in your mouth. Oh, no, no, <laughs> definitely. That was, and then you had a nice, you know, picture to go with it, which was awesome because like you didn't have to sit there and read a whole bunch of, uh, it, it, we all have it, but we don't know how to manifest it. Or we just think that it's too big of a system for us to fight against. And this is convenient. And I have to now turn myself over to work eight hours. I have to turn my child over to childcare for eight hours so I can work these eight hours to get the food that's that's available for me. So when you have like agrarian trust and its model, and this is community-based, I don't, I'm still having to convince BIPOC community, like there's a system out here like this that exists and they give, you know, they give land and it, there's no restrictions to it. So there was just, there's a lot of questions on people just not even knowing whether to trust it, you know, like halal meat, like, is this something that else that's just been commodified? And I think the history of the agrarian trust definitely helps you know, with that, um, there's models all around the world, you know, that people can, um, that people can uh, reference. It's not, it's not something new, it's something new here, but um, trust me, we've been trying to get land for a while. There's not a lot of people that are willing to give this, give this much, you know, because of the abundance of what the agrarian commons, um, how the agrarian trust has. And it's not just in land, and it's in, as a resource, it's how to navigate it as well. Cause that's been the, the biggest thing is like, I, we barely get recognition from large organizations and they give us this time frame for land for five or 10 years. It's gonna take you that long to even learn the systems on how to make it sustainable. So why would I just stress myself out? I see so many young farmers or farmers period who are burnt out from not having a lot of support. And because you're trying to explain these crazy systems to people and it's like, why would you want to do that? There's McDonald's right there. There's a grocery store right there. And it's like, that's why we don't have nutri nutrition or nutrients in our food. You know what I mean? It's just been mass produced and that's not the answer. So having the agrarian commons to see the holistic approach to it was something that was again, stuck out to me because what was offered before was just occupancy, you know, just to occupy the land. Yeah, and you know, you referenced earlier that a lot of the sort of lease relationships are are sort of sharecropping, just you know, 2.0, which is a different version of that. And you know, I, I can see for myself that part of the reason that the commons model really resonates with me is because you all are joining us as leaseholders, but you, Adasha, are joining us as a board member and then governing that lease. So you're kind of leasing from yourself, right? Um, which the intention is then to sort of uh, you know, flatten some of those power structures that show up when you have a lease and a, you know, and a land, a land owner. And, and we're all building this. So I'm sure that we will, you know, make missteps and learn and continue to sort of grow as we navigate this decommodified system within a legal system that commodifies, um, commodifies land. Yeah, no. I, um, and that's what makes it hard. Cause every time I hear the term lease, I just like cringe. Cause it's, I, I, you know, it was sad to see the sigh of relief, you know, when people say, oh, it's, you're just leasing it. What, what, what does that mean? You know, or, you know, they don't, they're not looking at us as neighbors. They're just looking at us as, you know, a body that's going to be there for a period of time. And it's like, um, that's just the terminology that's legal, you know, in order for this to trans, trans, transpire. But know that our intentions are to keep this, you know, this land, you know, and build a system and have that inherited, you know, by folks that look like us, you know, and, and keep that going to where there's a, there, we actually have a stake in this equity, you know, talk that's going on. Um, so even though it's 99 years, like it's just not, it's, there's not that cap to it, 
you know, it needs to be there. And I think that for Agrarian Commons to put it together like that, it was really easy for me to be like, I may not know who is going to be in 99 years, but I know and I trust in this system because well, I'm part of this system. I can see this system that people like me or have visions of something similar can can take that over and we, we're not starting from scratch. We're actually building community from one point to the other. So you don't see that. Yeah. In a lot of well, I really. I really appreciated that long that long term vision and you know in all of our conversations during the application process as we were sort of getting to know each other a thing that really struck out to me. Um, was that uh, you you all have a bunch of vision for things that you would like to realize, but you're holding kind of the steps to get there loosely because you really want to come in and get to know not just the the, the geographical land, but the neighbors and the people who make up would be the people who have you know, been involved with this piece of property before. Oh, I don't, now I'm going to back up. I don't like the word property, but have been involved with stewarding this land or, you know, adjacent parcels and moving at that pace of relationship as opposed to kind of parachuting in with a set, like this is 100% what we're going to do and, and A, B, and C. And I feel like there is a lot of institutional pressure as um, white folks are making attempts to step back and make more space for power sharing to still really want that kind of like, here's the step one, two, three. Um, and I'm really excited to be in this kind of playing space of like, let's vision and dream together, um, but vision and dream, not just with us, the commons and, and you all as the leaseholders, but also with the Whidbey community and also with this land and the people who have stewarded this land for since time immemorial. And coming in with that as the pacing, um, because we understand that this is going to be a multi generational initiative and not uh, like pop in, try and solve something on a funding cycle. Right. And that was, um, that was, that's huge because, you know, we've seen um, a lot of people try in different areas. And even though you have funding and your mission and your vision and everything's planned out to the T, but it's always about, you know, your comfort to do the work so your neighbors are are important so um just knowing that community is at the center at the center of everything we do because i don't need to have an enterprise you know what i mean like i don't need i personally don't need this um who may need it you know when she's of age you know or even growing up is like my daughter and she can't do that alone so she needs community we all need community so you can't build you can't build something and then invite the community to it and say that it's equitable. If you're not on the ground, seeing where the gaps are, you know, making systems for those gaps and including community, it's that you're just creating another system. And that's my fear of this whole thing is that I know it's a lot of work. Um, I do have kind of that the, the time to get it done. Most of the farmers, they're out, you know, they're farming. They don't have time to, to keep up on policy and change and lobby and, and whatnot. That's why there's always been people in the field and people in the house. You know what I mean? It's like they don't have to do that work. But we're asked right now as activists, as organizers, as farmers, and, like, and, and everything else we're doing, we're doing it all. So we're exhausted. So that was the first thing I had to do when asking, you know, fellow partners, like, hey, we got land. I know, already know. It's like it sounds great, but we're like, whoo. Who's gonna do that? You know, who, who's up for that? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so um, I, I wanna make sure that anything that I bring to the table, I've done my due diligence on because nobody's here for the okie doke anymore. Like we have to really move forward and move forward together quickly. So as many avenues that we can have to vet folks, you know what I mean? And, and, and really who's really willing to get out here and, and do that work. You know what I mean? And not just sit at one part, one end of the table and collect. You know what I mean? All of this goes back. And that was something else I really appreciated with the model of, um, you know, paying rent, you know, to, you know, the Duwamish and, and, the, and the tribes that are here. And it's like going, that was something that was huge. You, you don't hear, you hear people say, you know, pay back and it's optional or whatnot, but to actually build that into a model to where um, it's being acknowledged. You know what I mean? Um, hopefully having them on the land and building that community, it's a way, you know, to where I'm not trying to gain off of you and, you know, and I'm not here for you to gain off of me. We have to build it together. And it has to, that's my whole thing. It has to 
after I'm gone, this has to keep going. Well, we're just about out of time, but I feel like this feeds really well into, you know, the last question that I feel like this is like, how, how can the larger community on Whidbey and Puget Sound, how can they support you in your efforts? Where are there opportunities to get involved? Um, I, I know I'm going to share some of the links to your website and some of that, but anything that you want to share, uh, you know, as you said, because we all kind of have to, to chip in to work on this. Right. Um, well, we will definitely, um, right now at Small Acts in Woodenville, um, they're doing um, workshop where they're doing uh, Families on the Farm on Wednesday. So that's something closer. Um, and it's on the mainland. And we're hoping to, after we kind of reconnect to the land on Woodby, start to hold retreats over there for people to being able to process and do the same thing. So look out for that. Um, the, the land at Woodby would be addressed as Black Seed. Um, the project, you know, where we're, we're trying to, everything that's grown at Black Seed will be um, sold as a CSA, a community supported agriculture food box. So look out for the Black Seed um, CSA box um, for people who are wanting to buy starts or, or, or really get that cons consultation in there for permaculture design. Um, we, we can connect you with folks to do that and not really lose into your crop cycle. We can do those starts there. So we have a you know, few business models to where let us know, you know, it's all about capacity building. So how can we help you? We do have a lot of avenues for that, but also really wanting to um, reach out to the schools as we're talking about DI work and equity work, really get allowing, you know, for the school districts to fund projects, you know, where the youth can come out and have those retreats, you know, on the land and really see what that that is about and not put the burden on the parent, you know what I mean? But really support something because people give you money for, or they'll give you assets and, you know, tangible things. But, you know, when it comes to accessibility to folks, you know, that's where the issue is. So it ends up being a project for the elite or folks that can afford it. And, you know, I really want to focus on um, if people want to give money and they want to donate, they can go to the website. All of that goes back to our um, our youth programs. We, um, we sponsor, we, we reimburse everything um, that has to do with their, their time here. So whether it's boots, clothes, equipment, now ferry travel <laughs> uh, to the island, uh, we're still working that out. There's a few buses that we're gonna um, figure out. I heard that there's a free bus from Everett to, um, to Woodby. So making that information available um, for folks, um, support BIPOC supply chain. We have, um, you can go to the farm stand in Bothell on Bothell and Maine at the new pop-ups. Um, we will be selling a lot of the produce that's coming off of Whidbey Island um, Farm um, once that gets up and going there, in addition to um, just really working things out with folks on the island on what we're able to do, but really making sure that we don't have waste because of failed relationships, that that food, no matter what, is going into the mouths of folks that need that, need it, um, and going into boxes and that are culturally relevant and support you know one's system and, and way of um, thinking, because I know when we first started helping the um, Afghan refugees in, in uh, Thanksgiving, they asked me, Adasha, can you get halal turkeys? And I'm like, sure, who are you giving them to? And they said, the Afghan refugees. I was like, two problems. One is they're staying in a hotel, so they probably have no way to break that turkey down, but two, they, have, well, they don't have turkeys there, you know? So really thinking forefront of, you know, how we're able to support, um, organizations that are that are that are trying to do the work and hopefully um with the links and stuff that are there and with the um the food boxes that's the main thing we don't want food to go to waste so if people can sign up um we have herbs we have um a microgreen gardening you know sets and kits you know that they're that the youth are putting together everything they're doing is, is providing entrepreneurship um avenues for them after they leave the program to maintain their own um business you know whether it's full-time or part-time and giving them those resources and producer training, BIPOC producer training, food systems training, food handler training. Um, so, so anything that you donate, trust me, it goes straight back um, into youth development. And so our AmeriCorps project does end in August. And so we are looking for ways to um, extend that. And if we are able to secure 200 boxes um, at $35 a week during our CSA, we are able to hit our goal to where we're we can maintain ourselves, um, provide food to the community and not have to ask for another grant. You know, um, they're nice, but they're not always guaranteed. And what was popular last year is never popular the next year. So 
that's our goal for this year. So any support in that avenue, and we do a buy one, give one. So anything that you are um, buying from Modest Family Solutions is definitely being supported and gifted to someone who does not have that $35. Because like I said, we, we, we have that, we, we have resources. So it's about the management of it. Thank you so much, Dasha. Um, really looking forward to, yeah, working together with you as we grow uh, the Commons project, not just on Whidbey, but elsewhere. And um, I'm sure all of you out in Facebook land will see much more from us out here. Uh, hope you all have a nice Friday night and a nice weekend. All right, thank you.